What is up guys? Wrestling Premiere is here. Okay, this one was cool. I didn't think Matt expected himself to be a main eventer with the character, but he just went out there and had fun. This character was so damn 2002. The internet jokes, the Matt facts, everything was there, and those Cruiserweight segments were hysterical and he should have lasted longer. It's a shame we didn't get to see him as a good guy, because he didn't have much segments as a face. I just think he probably would have gone down much better as a good guy, but who knows. Matt Hardy version 1, let's get into it. At this point, Matt and Jeff were quietly separating Team Extreme. Lito was out for a year and a half, and it seemed like the team ran its course in a way. At least that's what the company felt. So they were set to push Jeff as a single star, but for that to happen, they must be as far away from one another. As for how that happened, on the August 12, 2002 episode of Raw, Eric Bischoff booked a matchup between RVD and one of the Hardys. A coin flip was to determine who gets the match and the title shot at SummerSlam, whoever wins that match. Throughout the segment, Matt was completely ignored by Eric Bischoff, and the Raw GM even asked for his name, like, who are you? He responded on Matt with the two T's, like, that's how bad it's gotten for him. The coin flip itself wasn't even a coin flip. If Bischoff just looked at the coin like this, he didn't even flip it, and he just chose Jeff to face RVD. So this match was for the Raw spot in the IC title match, right? Well, during the match, Matt Hardy ran in there and hit a twist of fate on his little bro. The ref was down, the fans booed, and RVD ended up winning that title shot. Like, seriously, Jeff Hardy in WWE, he almost never beat RVD. I know he did, you guys told me that in a previous video, but it's so weird. Like, every time I see it, RVD one-ups him. Anyways, Matt's reasoning for turning on his brother is simple. He's handed the opportunities while he's just left in the dust. That's what it was. And Jeff, he's the one that screws up. He, he blows these opportunities while he, Matt, is never even given the chance to get a chance at these titles. That's how bad it was. But from here on, it was better for Matt. On the August 15th episode of SmackDown, Matt Hardy defected to the blue brand. He made an impact by running in there and saving the team of Hardcore Holly, Shannon Moore, and the Hurricane. Watching it though, you wouldn't notice because it wasn't exactly a save. He ran in there and the good guys already settled their business. Backstage mass made it seem like an even bigger deal than it was. I saved you guys. The fans went nuts. They did, by the way. I'm the best or something like that. And Hardcore's face, like, it just says it all. Also, FYI, Hurricane and Moore knew Matt pretty well due to the fact that they lived miles away from one another and the fact that Moore's trainer was actually Matt himself a couple of years earlier. Once again, the following week, Matt ran in there and saved his two old buddies. Barely. And he bragged about it again despite not doing anything. He made himself seem like an even bigger deal. The pop was 10 times louder and he even bet that he'll receive an even bigger pop once he comes out again. Now for context, this was Fayetteville, so obviously they were going to cheer him. I mean, it's Carolina. What did you expect? As for his debut match on SmackDown against Chavo, he was in the driver's seat, but then the pyro went off. A video on Kane played and Chavo capitalized to win the match. What followed this was a losing streak. He was demolished by Brock, and despite the beating, he made himself look like a million bucks backstage. He's teaching Shannon more lessons. I did this, I did this, blah, blah, blah. And after this, Matt faced Hardcore Holly. Despite using the tights for leverage, Matt found himself in the same situation to lose the match. So basically, what goes around comes around. He's complaining as if he's the victim at this point, and he wasn't an all-out heel yet, but he was getting there. He was stirring the pots, getting into details no one gave a damn about. My girlfriend did this. Oh, I'm gonna buy Vice City when it comes out. Whatever the hell he was talking about. He just added some nonsense to the conversation that didn't really make sense. That's what I'm trying to say. And he was getting his ass kicked in the process of doing all of this stuff. At one point, he was thrown around by The Undertaker. Matt Hardy then demanded a match against Big Evil. He was full of confidence and matitude. Hell, he even guaranteed victory for that night, which is stupid in hindsight. But it was revealed why he was so confident. That's why. He debuted the lift for the moment song on this night, I believe, and while he didn't make good on that promise, he didn't lose either. The Undertaker had way bigger fish to fry, or trout to fry, and Matt actually won by countout. He didn't specify how he'd win, but he technically made good on that promise. The whole Matt and Undertaker story didn't conclude there. First of all, Matt would finally break that losing streak by pinning someone in a matchup against his friend the Hurricane. That friendship was thrown out the window when Matt Hardy tried to cheat to win. He couldn't beat his buddy in a straight up wrestling match and he resorted to some cheap or very lucrative tactics. The sensei of Mattitude interfered in the main event on Unforgiven, review coming soon I promise, and he got his ass handed to him. Basically, long story short, he was a pawn in the game. It wasn't like Brock was a big fan of Mattitude. It wasn't like he was going to become a follower. He was just using Matt to get to The Undertaker. Matt was getting destroyed by Big Evil almost every week, and there was no repercussions coming from Matt. Like, he wasn't returning the favor or anything like that. It was always Brock that came in and won up to Taker, not Matt himself. 
until the October 3rd episode of SmackDown. On that night, Matt had his final match with The Undertaker, and it was false count anywhere. Obviously, it was punished, tried running away from Taker, but it was revealed to be a brilliant tactic. Lesnar from out of nowhere attacked, and he f 5 Big Evil onto a crate of popcorns, I believe that is, and Matt went for the cover to actually win the match. The following week, Matt Hardy came out to brag about his victory from the previous week. The very ecstatic founder of Mattitude made it clear that he's 2-0 against The Undertaker. He believed it was a defining moment in the era of Mattitude when he single-handedly proved his dominance over the dead man. As he was rattling on, The Undertaker walked into the arena and approached Matt. He wanted some Mattitude. Version 1 made it seem like he was going to destroy and cripple Taker, but it turned out Mattitude needed a patch of sorts as he was left a bloody shell. Sure, he fought back, but The Undertaker had too much fire in him. No matter what Matt dished out on him, Taker was back up. Many officials tried separating them, but to no avail, until The Undertaker drove his injured hand into the steel post. Matt took the time to run the hell out of there, and looking at this, it's shocking that Matt wasn't used as some sort of sacrificial lamb for Lesnar, because that's what Undertaker usually did in the era. Following this, Matt began developing this version 1 character. He had a new Titan Tron that was unlike anyone else's at the time. The first fact he featured had something to do with The Undertaker, and it added depth to his character in a way. He was the I'm cooler than you type, and he had his facts to back it up on the Titan Tron. It was simple, yet effective. Sometimes his mouth got him into some tricky situations. He named his followers the MFers, which was pretty cheeky. There was a whole website dedicated to the teachings of Mattitude. There it is, by the way. Also, he used to call his trainees morons, basically. Eventually, on the December 19th, 2002 episode of SmackDown, Matt Hardy introduced a new, or the first follower of Mattitude, Shannon Moore. He used him as an excuse to escape his match with Brock Lesnar, and he tossed him in there to the Great White Shark, and that throw, good god, what the hell was that? I, I was utterly shocked when I seen it while I was making this, like, the fact that Lesnar threw him around as if he was nothing caught me off guard. Lesnar ragdolled him around and hit a vicious F5 on the torque, as you can see here, that was honestly ridiculous in itself. And that was all. Matt received his a minute later after he was distracted. The following week, Matt came out along with Shannon Moore, who was limping. The reason why the little MFers were here was because Matt issued a challenge to Brock Lesnar. He believed that Brock Lesnar was a problem for the entire SmackDown roster, and he praised Shannon for fighting through the pain and standing right here in the middle of the ring in spite of that. Then Matt challenged Brock to a match for the first SmackDown of 2003. Right afterwards, Matt decided, you know what, let's do this. He attacked his own damn follower, the one guy that believes in him, not his brother, no one. Just this guy, this is the only guy that believes in him. Matt Hardy in the entire locker room, he attacked him. He tried to make it seem like he's gone serious. That demeanor did show when Matt blasted the hell out of Brock with a chair, and he busted the back of his head open. Brock was seething, and once he seen his own blood, he was raging, and he was chomping at the bit to just grab Matt Hardy. Matt was starting to get scared, and he was practically back with Shannon. He wanted the extra protection out there for when Lesnar goes in raw, and that protection that Matt was asking for did nothing. This was basically a 2003 Brock Lesnar highlight reel. You know, those moves, the backbreakers, the slams, all that stuff. Sure, at one point, Matt had some fight in him, but Brock got it all together. He threw around both men, but then he found himself on the receiving end of a twist of fate. Lesnar kicked out at the last second, and then he led Matt into the F5 to win the match. From here on, Matt began to focus on winning the Cruiserweight Championship. Problem with this was the fact that he was a bit overweight in cruiserweight terms. Another thing to mention is that whenever Shannon Moore makes a slight mistake, such as taking credit for Matt's victory, the Sensei is there to deliver a service pack in the form of a mean slap. At the Royal Rumble, Matt Hardy at one point dominated, he hit the twist of fate on the other guys there, when his brother Jeff entered the match. He tried convincing him to be an MF'er, but he wasn't having it. At one point, Shannon Moore even saved his leader by putting his legs up in order to prevent an elimination, and hell, he even sacrificed himself when Jeff wanted to hit the Swanton. Anyways, Matt lasted longer than his bro at 27 minutes before getting thrown out by Brock Lesnar, the eventual winner. Moving on, Matt Hardy announced to the world that he's going to lose 10 pounds in order to enter the cruiserweight division. I believe he was uh, 230 pounds. He's going to go from that all the way down to 220 because that was the cruiserweight limit back then. Over the next couple of weeks, Hardy was shown training his heart out in order to get that title shot. One of the Matt facts revealed that he's been miserable, dieting, and eventually he reached that goal of 205. These segments were pretty hilarious in hindsight. And at one point, Matt had to take off his pants and his damn underwear in order to reach his goal of 220 pounds. At No Way Out, Matt Hardy beats Billy Kidman to capture his first and only Cruiserweight Championship. The match itself, not bad. Sure, at some points there were some gasps, like some of the thoughts that Matt might not win. 
but with the help of Shannon Moore, he had a super twist of fate to win the title. The training paid off, and sure, he got slapped by his bro earlier in the night, but he's the one who stood tall. I mean, his brother lost to Chris Jericho, so there's that. The training paid off and he was on a very good place. The only thing standing in his way was his weight. His first challenger for the gold was Rey Mysterio. After retaining the title against Billy Kidman, Matt Hardy's opponent for WrestleMania was to be determined by a number one contenders match. REY won that match to clinch his spot at WrestleMania. Now, the match itself actually opened up the show and it was pretty good. High pace. It was a blink and you miss match. Ray was flying all over the place. Matt was finding dubious ways to keep the title in his possession. And both men certainly belonged on the stage of WrestleMania. Also... How did they do WrestleMania without Matt previously? That's like one of life's biggest questions. Anyways, Matt took control and he dictated the pace for like two seconds, that's all. Ray was jumping around, Shannon was helping, and Matt at one point, he had a twist of fate. Despite this, Ray kicked out and he was shocked. There was this cool moment over here. Mysterio had the match one at one point, but Shannon put Matt's foot on the rope. Okay, it was no problem in Ray's eyes. He hit the 619, and just when he was about to drop the dime... He was unable to when he found himself in a very uncomfortable situation, which Matt took advantage of to steal the win. Awesome match, and if they win another couple of minutes, it might have been even more memorable than it already was. This match lasted for nearly 6 minutes, and it was so damn good. Rey Mysterio, he's the master of sub 10 minute matches like this. This guy, I can't even say anything bad about his matches. Thinking he's the guy now, version 1 got a little over his head and decided to challenge the one guy that was causing him trouble on SmackDown, Brock. Lesnar. He believed that the champ should get over this concussion thing and face him in a champion versus champion match the following week. Now about that match, not to discredit Matt, he did bring the fight in the beginning, but when Brock found his groove, he chewed Matt and spit him out basically. Following this, Matt continued to coast along before finding another person to be a follower of Mattitude. It was Crash. He was training in order to reach the mf -er position, like Shannon Moore was. And his Italian trial was honestly hilarious, as you can see here. But anyways, Matt's rivalry with Rey Mysterio continued on the June 5th, 2003 episode of SmackDown. The Cruiserweight Championship, for the first time ever, main evented a SmackDown. They main evented over a Piper's Pit segment, Kurt Angle's return, and a John Cena and Chris Benoit match. I personally find it cool that it main evented. Add in the morons and Ray's family sitting in front row and made for an intense and extravagant atmosphere along with the fans. After attacking Ray, those two morons were ejected from ringside and Ray had the entire crowd support seeing as he was miles away from his hometown of San Diego. Matt continued to cheat, he targeted the groin and hamstring area, but Ray fought back. Hell, he even hit the 619, but then the morons behind the ref's back slammed the challenger on the mat, no pun intended. This gave way to Matt hitting a leg drop which should have ended the match. But it didn't. Ray then caught Matt off guard with a leg drop and the fans went crazy. Their guy won the match. Dominic entered the ring. Ray's wife shed tears of joy and he finally arrived. That's a story for another day. And he did arrive about a year earlier. But it's a milestone in Ray's career. That's what I'm trying to say. As for Matt, he was on SmackDown most weeks. He wasn't showcased as much as he was previously, but whenever he was on TV, he had some kind of story like Eddie Guerrero and Zach Gowan. Those weren't that notable. Matt at one point even lost to Gowan at No Mercy, which is weird because they released him a couple of months later. Uh, Crash was released in June. Shannon Moore, he was eventually left alone on SmackDown because Matt opted to move to Raw after his contract expired on SmackDown. This was in storyline, by the way, but in reality, I believe it had something to do with Lita. On the November 17th, 2003 episode of Raw, Chris Jericho hosted the highlight reel. He introduced Lita, who was skeptical of Y2J's intentions, but there wasn't any bad in there. At least that's what it looked like, as Chris Jericho revealed that this guy's contract expired on SmackDown, and now he's on Raw. The moment that Titantron showed those letters, the typing sound, the fans, they were so damn happy, and now he came. Matt Hardy, his Titantron was updated, and he was back on Raw. He wanted to start off this Raw run with a bang by proposing to his girl, but just when he was about to pop the question, Molly Holly from out of nowhere complained about this. Jericho then suggested a tag match, allowing for Molly to choose her partner to face Lita and Matt. She chose Eric Bischoff. Meanwhile, Matt and Lita were in totally great spirits. As for how the match went, freaking Matt turned his back on his girl. Bischoff took advantage and scored the victory. What this meant? Well, the pre-match stipulation was if Lita lost, she was fired. So she was gone. Matt then called Lita selfish. Why? For being sidelined. She didn't join her lonely boy on SmackDown. She only cared about herself. She got back in shape for herself, and upon her return, she failed to win the Women's Championship. He then ended things with Lita as the fans booed. Basically... He believed Lita was selfish, and she didn't even succeed in doing what she wanted to do, so it was all for nothing, so he's done. 
As for the fired Lita, Christian got her a job back, it was due to the Survivor Series favor. The story in itself more since it's something far and far away from Matt Hardy, and that remake will come soon, I promise. As for Matt Hardy, uh, he became Raw's biggest jobber, like he was a jobber to the stars. He wasn't losing to lesser known guys, he was always losing to the Chris Jericho, those kinds of guys basically. Goldberg, all those guys. He was only winning matches on heats, but on Raw, he was always losing. And the V1 character, the version 1 character, was slowly phased out later on, once he turned face, to save Lita from a cane attack, and that was it. The facts did appear for a couple of weeks afterwards, but it was just Matt Hardy of 2005, basically. I'll focus on that cane story eventually, but this is where I'm gonna have to end the video, because Matt Hardy version 1 was basically done. Now the question, why was Matt Hardy V1 awesome? It was unique, that's why. He used the internet to make an entirely new character, he didn't rely on his old Hardy Boy shtick, and it was the most early 2000s thing ever. The Titan Trons were very cheeky like this one, the Fax thing, that was awesome, and when he entered the Cruiserweight division, it was entertaining, and everything he did in this run, it was a first in his career. His character was a totally different guy. He was the biggest mark for himself, he was the biggest fanboy of himself basically and he literally had some kind of like teachings, I wouldn't call it a religion, it was just the teachings of some sort. He had his own followers, it was so damn different. Never before was he this kind of arrogant, annoying, and hilarious heel. The stuff he did was cracking me up. He refused to learn his lesson with Brock, which I found stupid as hell. He trained legit to work as a cruiserweight. The disrespect he showed to the MFers was something. And it's a damn shame they lost ideas on booking him on Raw. He should have gotten some other MFers. Would have went for the IC title, perhaps. Yeah, he should have done something on Rob. It's like the moment he appeared on the brand, they only had one idea, the Lita thing, which they did after a week, and that was all. They didn't think of what to do with him ahead. So yeah. What'd you guys think of Matt Hardy version 1? Please comment down below. And that's your first video. Make sure you hit a side effect on the like button, and perhaps the twist of fate on the subscribe button. Peace. I'm out.